Between Mother's Day and Father's Day this year, we are going to have a brief series of messages that I am entitling, Our Obligation to the Next Generation. And to introduce not only this message, but really this series, I'd like to go back in the archives a bit uh, and introduce it with these words. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. When those words were first spoken over six decades ago, hard to believe that, there was a real sense that a new generation of Americans was emerging on the scene. John F. Kennedy had just been sworn in as the 35th president of the United States. He was the youngest man ever to be elected to that office. He was the first president born in the 20th century. And many of his advisors and associates were closer to his age than they were most of the people that were in government already. And even though many years have passed since those words were spoken, I believe those words ring true today, not only for our country, but also for our church. It has been said that the church is always one generation away from extinction. If we do not pass that torch of our faith to the next generation, this local church will not survive. Sadly, we're seeing that all around our country. We're seeing the shell of a church that used to be. And many times it's because somewhere that transfer of faith did not happen, and a church will die. Like a relay team at a track meet, the passing of the baton to the next runner is crucial. Good relay teams will spend hours practicing that baton pass because it doesn't matter how fast you are, if you drop a baton, you probably lost the race. I believe that as adult Christians, we need to take seriously the biblical command to pass on that baton of faith to the next generation. And it's so important because it seems that our children have everything working against them. It's not going to happen automatically. Satan is saturating our young people's minds with concepts that are diametrically opposed to God's word. The peer pressure that teens face today is nothing like what you and I faced when we were that age. And yet too often, as adults, we don't do much to help them cope with what they're going through. Much is said today about what we need to do for future generations. Save the planet from global warming. Preserve natural resources. Reduce the debt burden on those who are yet to come. The list goes on and on. And, you know, these may all be noble pursuits, but I don't think it's what we really need. Physical, mental, emotional relational health, they're all important. But unless we pass on a spiritual heritage to our children, we have failed them. 
Douglas MacArthur said this at the end of World War II when he accepted the surrender of the Japanese forces. He said this, We have had our last chance. If we do not now devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. The problem is basically theological and involves a spiritual renewal and improvement of human character. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. Now, you're not going to hear that in today's world, but I think he was right on. If you want to pass on a world for the next generation, they need a spiritual foundation. And so over the next four weeks, I want to address our obligation to the next generation. In these four weeks, I'm not going to cover everything that we can pass on to them. You may or may not agree with the four areas I've chosen, and that's fine, but we've got to start somewhere because it's not going to happen automatically. And we're going to begin by teaching them about the Lord. That's where it must start. In fact, I would summarize my approach in the title of the classic song, Teach Your Children Well. You can tell I was pretty nostalgic this week when I was preparing this message. Just as the Israelites were about to enter the promised land, Moses gave his farewell address because he knew he would not be accompanying them over the Jordan River. And we find that address in the book of Deuteronomy. More than once in that book, Moses instructs the Israelites to teach your children well. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. It's not enough that you know the truth. You have a responsibility to pass that truth on to the next generation. A few chapters over in Deuteronomy chapter 11, passage that was read for us earlier, we hear very similar words. Beginning in verse 18, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give to your forefathers, as many as the days that the heaven are above the earth. You might think, wow, Moses, you got a memory problem? I mean, you just said that a few chapters ago. (laughs) He wasn't trying to fill in time. He did it for emphasis. You need to hear this, and you need to hear it again. These commands that I'm giving you today, they need to be in your hearts, but not just yours. You need to pass them along. You need to impress them upon your children. And we see similarly in the New Testament, Ephesians 6.4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. What's he saying there? Teach your children well. And where that begins is by teaching them about the Lord. We need to instill upon them the truth about God and his word. God's desire is that there be a conscious 
consistent transfer of God's truth from the older to the younger. And if there's an unconscious mistake that many Christian parents make, is thinking that our children will automatically capture our zeal for the Lord. If there's anything automatic, it's that they won't. (laughs) It doesn't come naturally. It's something that must be done intentionally. Now, I want to begin this morning by looking at the conflict of our teaching. By that, I don't mean contradictory things we say as we teach but rather those elements that are working against us as we are trying to teach our children. First of all, our school systems are working against our children. Now let me be very careful here. I am not singling out individual teachers. I know many godly Christians that teach in our public school systems, and I have no doubt that they are faithfully executing their job in that role. But as a system, they are being mandated to teach a lot of things that I'm sure goes against their own personal convictions. And the schools are indoctrinating our young people with a philosophy of moral relativism. There are no absolutes. Everybody can do whatever they want. You don't like your reality? Create a new one. Find your true self. Don't listen to anybody else. You just follow your heart. That's what they're being told. Tolerance is extolled as the highest virtue. You have no right to question or criticize someone else's choices or actions. They're taught that the world occurred accidentally. Life itself developed by chance through evolution. And these things are being taught from kindergarten on. If they graduate from high school with their values still intact, they face an even greater pressure if they go on to a state university. They're often taught there that the Bible is a book of mythical stories. That Christianity has been harmful to the world. That Christians are unloving and intolerant because they believe everyone should abide by the same set of values. Facts about America's history and heritage, Western civilization's moral roots, the historical reality of the Bible, scientific evidence for creation, they're all suppressed or ignored in most state schools and colleges. So our school systems are working against our children. Secondly, the government is working against our children. Abraham Lincoln once said, the philosophy of the school in one generation will become the philosophy of the government in the next. And we have absolutely seen that to be the case. If you wonder why our government on a state and a federal level has gone so liberal in recent years, go back a generation or so. It started in the state universities where socialism and communism were being praised and pushed. And who do you think is hearing that? Our future teachers, our future lawyers, our future lawmakers. They're being trained in it, and then when they go out and they hold office, they're already thinking along those lines. Our government is consistently communicating values that are anti-Christian and, quite honestly, sometimes anti-American. This push towards socialism and extremism has been fostered in our universities for years. And nowadays, lawmakers are falling over each other to pass legislation that caters to fringe minorities in our culture in order to appear tolerant and relevant. School curriculum is mandated from the moment they walk into school about alternate lifestyles and alternate choices and how it's okay to make up your own reality and force others to live in it. And then finally, the media is working against our children. You know, for years, Hollywood has insisted that they don't shape values. They just reflect community standards. 
And yet at the same time, they go around and sell businesses on 30-second advertisements that's going to change the buying habits of the American people. <laughs> if they think they can influence people with a 30-second ad, what do you think they can do with an hour-long TV show or a two-hour-long feature film? And it has become the podium by which they are proclaiming their message. And it's becoming normal to accept all kinds of things that go against God's word. Add to this social media with its 24-7 access, exposing our children to bullying, explicit sexuality, the extremes of our woke culture today. And it's apparent that our young people today face much more pressure than we ever did growing up. It seems like everything is against them. And believe me, living in enemy territory can easily take its toll. But I believe the task of teaching children is the responsibility of the home, not some institution of the combined efforts of a group or professionals. Many years ago, there was a popular saying that I've heard repeated ad nauseum. It takes a village to raise a child, to which I just want to say, bull. All they're doing is trying to take the power away from the parents, and the government knows better, so let them do it. It takes parents to raise a child. Now, I'm not saying you got to do it all alone, but that's the primary responsibility. It starts at home. And if you think you can ship your children off to school or to church or to daycare or wherever and they're going to raise them for you, don't expect them to have the same values you have. If you don't teach them, who will? And if you're letting the society teach them, don't be surprised at what you end up with. We need to bring back the responsibility of raising our children where it belongs, and that is in the home. Mom and dad, and as we're going to see, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, the family can have a huge impact. But so many families today are allowing society to raise their children instead of they themselves. And then they say, well, I can't understand. They weren't brought up that way. Oh, yes, they were. Many parents take the attitude, we want our children to make their own decisions when it comes to faith. So they don't bring them to church. They don't instruct them about the Bible. They don't even talk to them about God. How can they make a choice if they don't know? Romans 10.14 says, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they haven't heard of him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Well, I guarantee you it's not going to be the schools and it's not going to be the government and it's not going to be the media that tells them about Christ. And what they do tell them about Christ isn't going to be right. <laughs> it's up to us. We must take that responsibility that has always been ours. Now I want to look at the content of our teaching. Going back to Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You could almost teach a theology course on that verse. <laughs> there is a lot of depth there. There is one God. He is the Lord, Yahweh, creator of heaven and earth. There are not many gods. There are not many ways that you can get to God. There is one God. This is called in the Jewish community the Shema. It's from the Hebrew word meaning to hear. Hear, O Israel. Listen. This is important. And this is a foundational statement about God. So important is this confession that Jewish boys in Orthodox homes are required to memorize it as soon as they can speak. 
some of the first words they learn is Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. They begin as soon as they can talk. Now remember, when Moses spoke these words, the people of God were about to enter into a land of many false gods. They were about to inhabit cities they hadn't established. They were going to live in homes they hadn't built. They were going to drink from wells they hadn't dug. They were going to eat from vineyards and and, uh, trees that they hadn't planted. And God knew that such instant prosperity was going to be a problem. Just picture this. Let's say tomorrow you were informed that you just received an inheritance of $100 million. Wow. Or maybe somebody gave you a lottery ticket, because we all know good Christians don't buy lottery tickets. Somebody gave you a lottery ticket and you want $100 million. Wow. You got it made, right? All your problems are over. (laughs) If you know anything about the lives of people who have won millions of dollars, it doesn't make all their problems go away. In fact, many of them end up broke and broken. Because as one person said, you show me one person that can handle prosperity, I'll show you a hundred that could handle adversity. When times are bad, we fall on our face and go, God! When times are good, we're like, yeah, I got it. I can handle this. And that's where the problems come. God knew that. He knew that the people were going to be prone to forget. And I think that if back then, then the nation of Israel, if they had what we have today, you know how they have a state bird and a state flower and a state this, that, and the other? I think the state flower of the people of Israel would be forget-me-not. Because that's what God told his people. Don't forget me when you get in there. Don't forget me when things are going good. Don't forget me when you get busy and life gets fast-paced. Don't forget about me. But it's going to take something deliberate. You're going to have to work at it. And that's why he said in verse 8, Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Some of the Jews took this very literally. They'd they'd put little boxes on their hands or their foreheads. I don't know that God meant them to take it literally, but he meant them to make it a big part of your life. I'll give you one example. I remember many, many years ago, my dad was a truck driver. And one of the ways he would learn scripture is he would take little index cards and he'd write a scripture and he'd stick it on the dashboard of his semi. As he's going down the road every now and then, he'd glance down and he'd see that scripture. That's what this is talking about. Maybe put a post-it note on your bathroom mirror or at the bottom of your computer monitor or whatever. Ways in which you are reminded in your everyday activity. We're not talking about coming to church on Sunday morning. We're talking about throughout the week. Being reminded of it. Verse 9, write them on the door frames of your houses on on your gates. Make it a part of your home. Make it a part of your life. Now, as I said, verse 4 is a classic statement of theology. It's about God. The Lord is one. Verse 5 is the logical conclusion of that. If there is only one God, how should we relate to him? And it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He went right back here. In Matthew 22, verse 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. 
You don't have to memorize a ton. Just get the basics. And I believe Jesus was referring to our heart being our emotions, our soul being our will, and our mind being our intellect. Our faith should not just be an emotional thing that comes and goes. Our faith should not also be only an intellectual thing that is cold as ice. It should involve all of our being. St. Augustine gave interesting advice when he said, Love God, then do as you please. <laughs> now, I know some people here that say, Oh, hey, that sounds pretty good to me. But if you truly love God, you're not going to do something that displeases Him. If you truly love God, you're not going to do something that's going to hurt Him or offend Him. You don't have to learn a big list of do's and don'ts. Love the Lord your God. And that can be your guide. When you're about to make a choice, is this really something I think God would have me do? You don't have to memorize a whole list of do's and don'ts. Just think about it. So that's the content of our teaching. There is one God. He is the creator of heaven and earth, and we are to love him with our whole being. Now I want to conclude with the context of our teaching. And for this, we go to the passage in Deuteronomy 11. Verse 19 says, Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. The ancient Hebrews had a word for formal communication, like preaching or lecturing. This is not that word. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. This is talking about the ordinary conversations you have as a family, where you're just talking about what happened in your day, what, how the Cubs or the Cardinals did last night, or, you know, you don't make a big deal about it. You don't lecture about it. You don't whip out a chart and say, give me three points here that you need to learn. You just talk about it. That's what Moses is saying here. Just talk about it. Just what's happening in your day? What happened at school? What's happening in the, in the neighborhood? What you, what you see on TV? Or what are you watching on, on your phone? Let's talk about it. That's the kind of conversation that needs to take place. You don't have to hold a class on it. You don't have to make a big announcement. And this is what makes Christianity authentic. It's fine on Sundays to come and we have what kind of a formalized worship service and you know, yeah, someone's preaching the word but you don't need that seven days a week. What you need seven days a week is just regular, ordinary conversation that takes what's being preached on Sunday and make it applicable on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday. Just very natural conversation. You know, anyone who relegates their Christianity to one hour a week, you don't stand a chance the other six days. It's as it becomes a part of our regular life that it's going to make a difference for us and it's going to make an impression on them. Christianity isn't a Sunday school lesson. It's a lifestyle. Each day when you get up from bed, you should talk about these things. When you're sitting around the supper table, the things of God should permeate our conversation. When we're driving, including you should include the Lord and his word in what we say. When it comes to bedtime at night, we can talk about the things of God. Just where life happens. And it happens in the home. You can't outsource biblical teaching. Moses didn't tell the Israelites, make sure you take your kids to Sabbath school at the tabernacle. He said, at home. This ought to be a regular part of your life. On the road. Now, for them, that meant walking. For us, it might mean walking or it could be driving. 
as we're driving along. Maybe you'll see something or hear something, and, and it'll bring up a conversation. Hopefully it's not, Dad, why are you driving so fast? <laughs> Maybe a learning moment there, too. Going to bed and getting up. Do you know that mornings and evenings can be times of insecurity for children? These are excellent opportunities to talk to them, remind them of God's love, maybe help them face the fears that they have. Just normal, everyday opportunities. Talking is an informal way of teaching. It doesn't have to be in a classroom. It doesn't have to have lesson plans. But when we're talking, we have an opportunity to talk about the Lord. And it's not going to happen automatically. We have to be intentional. We have to think about it. And the Israelites understood that transferring their faith wasn't going to occur in a single event like a baby dedication. This is a continual, lifelong discipline. Don't assume that your children are going to automatically embrace your values. We need to make a deliberate effort to saturate them with God's word. Paul gives an example of this in 2 Timothy 1.5. He wrote to Timothy, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. See here the generational, not just mom, but grandma. And, and grandparents, you have a great opportunity because if you're not already there, you're going to have a time when your grandkids think mom and dad are out to lunch. They're the most uncool people on the planet. I don't want to hear anything from them. But grandma and grandpa, they're cool. Oh, man, I remember there wasn't any place on earth I wanted to be more than grandma and grandpa's house. I mean, that, that's the place to be. You have a great opportunity to have an impact because they're going to listen to you at times in their lives more than they're going to listen to the parents. Maybe you don't have children of your own. Maybe you have nieces and nephews, and you can be that great uncle or aunt that is so cool, and they're going to listen to you. Maybe you can be that in the church. I remember growing up, we had Grandma Warnick, lived to be, what, 106 or something, drove herself to church well into her 90s. She was everybody's grandma. I remember one Sunday, we were taking prayer requests, and Grandma Warnick raised her hand, and she said, I'd like you to pray for my son. And the pastor said, oh, what's wrong? She said, old age. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy was in his 70s already, you know. And, but uh, you have that opportunity within your family, within the family of God. Take advantage of it. In that same book, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will be able to qualify to teach others. Now, we usually look at that as a great plan of discipleship. I want to suggest that's a great plan of parenting. Put children in place of reliable men. In Titus chapter 2, verse 3, teach the older women to train the younger women to love their husbands and children. This is within the church family. I don't believe that churches should all have the same, you know, age group and uh, you should be one homogeneous unit and all that stuff. That might work great for business marketing, but the church is to be a family with multiple generations and the older can teach the younger. We're just now starting to get some younger kids in our church praise God if you folks haven't been here on a Sunday night I'd encourage you to come out because we got a whole bunch of them over there and trust me the people that are working with those kids they'd love some help <laughs> you have an opportunity to make an impact in their lives will the torch be passed to the next generation Shortly before his administration was cut short by an assassin's bullet, President Kennedy said in an address to the United Nations, we have the power to make this 
the best generation in the history of the world, or to make it the last. Now, I'm sure he was thinking of nuclear weapons that could wipe out all human life on the planet. But let's take those words and apply it to the church. We can make this the best generation in the history of the church, or we can make it the last. If we fail to pass the baton of faith to the next generation, this church won't survive us. And that would be a tragedy. We see it all around us. Our obligation to the next generation is to teach the children well, beginning with teaching them about the Lord. We don't need scholars and experts. We need ordinary people willing to invest time, attention, and effort for our children. And may all who come behind us find us faithful.